LAPD operator 348. Yes, hi. Um, I live in Benedict Canyon, and um, my next door neighbor, one of our other neighbors, um, found her dog on the street yesterday. And, um, this is a 911 call from Christmas Eve 2000. This woman is calling in after finding her neighbor's dog in the street. And when she went to return the pet, she saw something suspicious. The owner's back door was wide open. So I don't know okay. what's going on. <laughs> the door is it's an open door. Y'all did not go inside. Oh, well, no, we're not. My husband's okay. Uh, me too. <laughs> she lives by herself, and I hate to think. Unfortunately, the neighbor was not okay. She was lying dead with a gunshot wound in the back of her head. Her name was Susan Berman, and she was Bob Durst's best friend. Hi, I'm Zach Stewart-Pontier, one of the filmmakers behind HBO's The Jinx. Welcome to the third episode of the official Jinx podcast, a show where we take you behind the scenes of Andrew Jarecki's documentary series that became a real-life murder investigation. As we get ready to release part two of The Jinx, April 21st on Max, today on the show, we're diving into chapter three, The Gangster's Daughter. Two decades later, Kathy Durst is suddenly more than a memory, thanks to a tip from a defendant in an unrelated case. In 1999, almost two decades after the disappearance of Kathy Durst, there was a new break in the case from an unlikely source. Here's former Westchester detective Joe Becerra. I had arrested an individual named Timothy Martin, and Timmy was arrested for several counts of public lewdness. He was basically exposing himself to women. After Timmy's conviction, his lawyers said their client knew something about a major cold case. What he stated was that he had heard that there was a young woman named Kathy Durst who was murdered by her husband at their cottage up in South Salem. This next part never made it into the show, but Andrew actually asks Bob about how the case of his missing wife got renewed attention. Oh, what was it? They arrested a flasher, and he said, oh, let me off. I know all about Durst. And this detective went and started looking into it, who's Durst, and got a file from the New York City police, and can't think of his name. But Timmy Martin. Right, all right. So he, he started investigating and spending time. Oh, sorry, the police officer was Joe Becerra. That's it, Joe Becerra. But the flasher was Timmy Martin. Well, I, <laughs> I'm pleased to say I'd never heard of him. Anyways. Detective Becerra and his colleagues were interested, and they started reinvestigating the case, doing things that had surprisingly not been done before, like searching Bob and Kathy's house and the lake next to it. Bob says he wasn't worried. I wasn't the least bit concerned about the details. The divers search the lake until you're blue in the face. What were the divers for? Obviously, they're looking for body parts, looking for something to be used as evidence. The divers came up short, Still, the investigators weren't ready to give up. They dug into some phone records and tried to piece together Bob's movements the week Kathy went missing. Here's Kevin Hines, former Westchester County assistant DA. We did some phone records sweeping, and we found that some of the phone records show that the Durst organization got uh, collect phone calls from Ship Bottom, New Jersey on Tuesday after Kathy's disappearance. Bob was one of the only people who made collect calls to his family's company. So the police had good reason to suspect Bob was in South Jersey right after Kathy disappeared. So there are three calls made to the Durst organization from Ship Bottom. Now, you were the collect call guy, so I think the speculation is, well, Bob must have made those phone Except calls. Bob didn't make those calls. Bob was not in Ship Bottom. Despite Bob's denial, any casual viewer of The Sopranos can understand why investigators were interested in these calls from South Jersey. If you go to Ship Bottom and the area surrounding the Pine Barrens, you see ample, ample real estate where he could have dumped the body. It's actually a place where mob bosses used to order that bodies be dumped. And what connection is that? Well, Susan Berman, who was very friendly with Bob at the time, um, had a lot of connections and a lot of friends to organize crime. Susan Berman was a name that Detective Becerra was quite familiar with. When he spoke with Kathy's friends, they kept bringing her up basically told me if anyone knows anything about Kathy's disappearance, it would be Susan Berman. 
Susan and I would spend a lot of time together. We could talk. We had the thing in, 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 in common. Both of her parents died when she was young. And I had one parent die when I was young. In her background, rich Las Vegas, mobster father. We're going to get back to Bob and Susan's relationship and what happens to her. But first, let's take a little detour to Las Vegas in the 1950s. Susan Berman's father was a powerful mobster, but she didn't find that out for years. She told the story in 1997 on This American Life. So let's say that your father is a big-time gangster. And like the man in the Godfather movies, actually does try to protect you from ever knowing what exactly he does for a living. What happens when you find out? I rushed to Martindale's bookstore, and I quickly looked at the index, Davy Berman, and it said Davy Berman, and in parentheses, who could kill a man with one hand behind his back. And a little later in chapter, it said that he had been wounded in an FBI a shootout with an FBI man in Central Park and done 11 years in Sing Sing. And then it went on to talk about his other partners. Well, I, I started to throw up in the bookstore. I was so shocked. I mean, it's just, you know, I you thought... You literally threw up in the bookstore? Literally. How gross, right? It was just, you know, a visceral reaction, you know. I couldn't believe it, and of course I didn't think it was true. Susan kept reading and found out that her father, Davy Berman, was a central figure in Las Vegas organized crime. He was one of the pioneers, mobster, gangsters, whatever you want to basically say, that founded Las Vegas. You know, everybody came to Vegas with the idea, we're men in our 40s, we've done hard time, we've had a criminal past, we're married now for the first time, we have children. This is our last shot, it better be good. Davy Berman ran the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas, and Susan got all the perks. I had my own Eloise at the Plaza kind of situation. I would go to the Flamingo every day after school with my dad. I was in the counting room, the famous counting room, and I saw them go three for us, one for the government, two for Meyer. I helped them count the bills. Meyer is Meyer Lansky, a famous crime boss. Even though Susan's dad was certainly connected, it seemed like he had a warm relationship with his daughter. Here's a special recording of the two of them together. Did you hear about the big cat fight in the candy store? No, I didn't hear about it. I did. Two suckers got licked. <laughs> um, if a man, if a farmer raised 2,000 potatoes on a sunny day, what would he raise on a rainy day? Well, I guess he'd raise some beets. No, he's an umbrella. Damn it, I never thought of that. Susan always wanted to see how far her dad's power really went. When I was growing up, I had the feeling my father was something was someone special. I mean, of course, he was special to me because I was with him all the time. But I could never quite get a bead on it. Who was he? Why was everyone deferential? You know, what was the thing? So I was always testing him. And of course, I was crazy about Elvis Presley because that was the years. And finally, my birthday was coming. And I said, you know, if you're so important, have Elvis Presley sing happy birthday to me. And he did. And then I thought, wow, he, he really, he's somebody here, you know? When Susan was 12, her father died in surgery. Then, a couple months later, she lost her mother. Susan was shipped off to live with her uncle Chicky on the West Coast. She spent her adolescence in boarding schools and eventually ended up at UCLA for college. And it's there that she met this guy. I saw this girl who looked very, very pretty wearing a white outfit and a white cap and black hair, and I went over and started talking to her. And we went swimming, and that was Susan Berman. Susan and Bob bonded immediately. We would spend a lot of time together. We could talk. We had the thing in, 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 in common. With, neither of us got a chance to meet our parents hardly at all. Linda Obst, one of Susan's friends, says that Susan saw a bit of her father in the rich, well-connected Robert Durst. Something happened when she met Bobby Durst. It was like, here's a man as powerful as my father. He is connected. He has money. He can always get out of trouble. And he needs me. And she always used to say, he needs me. We have a special friendship. After college, Susan became a journalist. She wrote stories for local papers, and she made a name for herself, eventually landing some pretty big interviews, like a pre-presidency Ronald Reagan. What do I call you now? Well, if, What do you uh, prefer to be I'll called, I'll answer sir? to hey you, but uh, <laughs> if, um, 
Uh, governor is one of those titles that you're supposed to retain for okay. all your life. Okay, I, I want to be yeah. you know pro right. proper. Uh, interview with Governor Reagan, June 24th. Okay, let's go. Um, governor Reagan, are you running for president? <laughs> Uh, I don't have the answer to that. Uh, there are a lot of people who think they have the answer to that, but I don't. I don't know. Her reputation in the journalism world grew, putting her on the radar of people like Steve Silverman. He would go on to edit page six and launch People.com. Here's Steve recalling the day they met. One day the phone rings in my office and said, I'm Susan Berman. I'm in uh, Southern California. I'm meeting editors. I want to meet you. She spoke a mile a minute. I said, please come in. I knew instantly who it was. She wrote the cover story for Francis Ford Coppola, who had just taken over City Magazine, uh, which was a very small publication in San Francisco. But suddenly, City Magazine was in Time Magazine because it had this very clever article by Susan entitled, Why Women Can't Get Laid in San Francisco. Steve gets the title slightly wrong. It was actually, Why I Can't Get Laid in San Francisco. It was not well written, but it was clever. It was uh, certainly a brilliant marketing ploy. And it put Susan's name on the map. Uh, so I knew it. When Susan walked in, it was suddenly like a nuclear power plant had exploded. I instantly got her life story. Uh, her father was a gangster in uh, Vegas, who uh, built the Flamingo Hotel and maybe pulled the gun on Bugsy Siegel. I mean, all this upon hello. Steve always recognized Susan's intense ambition. He says it was clear because of how she leveraged her relationship with Bob Durst. That was the first thing she told me about him. His family owns Times Square. Bobby offered Susan a certain cachet. As soon as you said Durst, people knew. And that worked to her advantage, and she worked it to her advantage. That was Susan. A couple years after meeting in San Francisco, Steve and Susan ended up in New York. Susan started writing for New York Magazine, and eventually she wrote a book that would be her big break. That little girl today is Susan Barman, and she is the author of Easy Street. You're a journalist, and you decided uh, you assigned yourself for really, uh, to find out who your dad really was. Yeah. You grew up to age of 21 not knowing that your dad was a gangster. How did you finally find out? Easy Street was Susan Berman's memoir about her father, and immediately it got noticed by a Hollywood producer named Linda Obst, who we heard from earlier. I knew of her writing in New York Magazine, and when I was making my ambivalent transfer from uh, journalism into the movie business, the Easy Street cover story came out in New York Magazine, and uh, it just struck me as a movie right off the top. I took her out to lunch, and it was a hotly fought over property. Linda convinced Susan to give her the rights to the project. I think she found me very strong, and uh, I guess I was a very good faker, because I didn't really know what I was going to do with the book yet, but I was full of piss and vinegar, and uh, I had a deal, and I was on my way. So I took it with me as my first property to Hollywood and was able to sell it early. Easy Street, soon to be a major motion picture. Well, maybe not soon, but someday. Linda sold the film to Universal Studios, and she and Susan started developing the screenplay. Over time, they became close, and Linda started to see an eccentric side of Susan. When you took her out to lunch, she had trouble crossing streets. She had trouble going into elevators. She had trouble going into tall buildings. And when you were going on meetings, um, you had to be her literal crutches to go on elevators, to cross streets, to, to be in cabs, to cross bridges. I think as far as her phobias are concerned, I think that kind of weakness is a kind of control as opposed to narcissism. Despite the difficulty of day-to-day -day life with Susan, there was a lot of buzz around Easy Street. Susan insisted that Bob Durst throw the book party to celebrate the release. Linda Obst struggled to understand. I didn't see what she saw in him. He wasn't like my kind of New York player. He seemed more like a little low rent to me, even though he's rich. I guess because she'd exaggerated him so much. And also he tries to get a lot of attention. He just wasn't impressive. And you'd think from what Susan had been saying all these years, he would have been impressive. Still, the celebration went pretty well. Everybody was there. 
every one of her New York Magazine contacts, every one of her famous friends, all her glitterati, every rich friend she ever had came out of the woodwork. And she was in her party dress. And, you know, it was really interesting about Susan at a party is that you felt like she was 10 years old and she was still at the Flamenco and she went, was waiting for her parents to come in. She was so unbelievably excited that you expected there to be balloons. The other interesting thing about this book party is that Kathy Durst was there. One of the last pictures that was ever taken of her before she disappeared was at this book party. And there's a shot of the three of them together, Bob, Susan, and Kathy. It's very chilly. After the party, it was time for Susan to write the actual movie script. Ultimately, the process of writing the script is what doomed the movie. As I sat at the table with her and did psychoanalysis. I got to see how mythologized her relationship with her father was, how it was the key relationship of her life and the key love affair of her life. And I had to plumb her to try to get underneath the platitudes of how she'd frozen her youth to try to make these characters come alive. No scenes. The script ran into problems. There's a reason you haven't seen or heard of Easy Street the movie. Linda says that Susan wasn't able to get beyond the mythology of her father. Where's Davy? Where's little Susan walking into the thing? Where's like, what do we have here? <laughs> I couldn't get her to let go of the script. And it was as though she was doing it to exonerate her father. We're back in 2000, detour over. Investigators in Westchester were looking back into Kathy Durst's disappearance. And one of the people they wanted to talk to was Susan Berman. Bob says to Andrew in their interview, around this time, Susan reached out to him. What did she say? The Los Angeles police contacted me. They want to talk to me about Kathy Durst's disappearance. Something happens to Susan then. Oh, not long after that, Susan Berman was murdered, around Christmas of 2000. The victim had sustained a gunshot wound to the head. Paramedic pronounced death at 13.48 hours. That's LAPD detective Paul Coulter. There was no evidence of any kind of forced entry. Whoever killed her had probably been let in uh, by Susan Berman. And there was another key piece of evidence that made it look even more likely that Susan was murdered by someone close to her. The Beverly Hills Police Department received a letter in the mail. The envelope was addressed Beverly Hills Police. Beverly is spelled wrong, spelled with L-E-Y instead of just L-Y. And the note read 1527 Benedict Canyon and the word cadaver. This killer cared enough about Susan to alert the authorities about the location of her body. Can you think of a reason why somebody might write a note like that? I can't imagine can't imagine. One of the speculations is that whoever wrote the cadaver note was Jewish because it's important in Jewish culture that you bury the dead quickly. And I, I just thought that somebody would have to be my, my rabbi, although I don't see him getting involved in any kind of a killing, he might feel that it's that important that, the, that it be buried right away. But I think you've got to be pretty, pretty, pretty Jewish, religious to feel that way. And, and now you're taking this big risk. Which, which big risk? You're writing a note to the police that only the killer could have written. That's one of those lines that Bob will come to regret. Meanwhile, the LAPD were focused on other suspects. They found out about Susan's mob connections, and they wondered if that might explain her murder. Susan's cousin, Tom Patton, had a similar thought. It was suspicious right away. Back of the head. That's traditional in mob killings. Several of the people closest to Susan doubted that Bob had anything to do with her murder. People like Susan's adopted son, Sarah Kaufman. He says he never believed in the theory that Bob could have killed her. And then it was around that time that people were starting to talk about him as a suspect. But it never made sense to me. Not for even a second. Sarah and Bob 
kept in touch, and they made plans to get together for dinner sometime after Susan's funeral. On his next trip around, Bob said he wanted to have dinner. And did you have that dinner? We did not. <laughs> we did not have that dinner. Why didn't that happen? Because apparently shortly thereafter, he was uh, on the run for, uh, well, at the time, it was uh, arrested for murder and dismemberment of a body. So he missed the dinner. <laughs> a teenage boy fishing in the shallow waters off Galveston, Texas, stumbled on the gruesome remains of a murder. We're back where we started, 2001. Garbage bags filled with Morris Black's body parts have washed up on the shore. The police are led to an eye clinic after finding Robert Durst's name on a receipt, and detectives were shocked when he actually came to pick up his eyeglasses. Here's Bob. Oh, I was arrested in Galveston. I spent one night in prison in Galveston. And I, I had been told by the, the detective that uh, you've been charged with murder. Bail has been set at $250,000. So I said, how do I go about doing this? He looks at me and says, do you have $250,000? I said, well, not on me. Was your intention when you put up the $250,000 to run away? Oh, goodbye $250,000, goodbye jail, I'll, I'm, I'm out. You can't give someone charged with murder or bail because they're gonna run away, of course. Bob went on the run. He was spotted outside the lake house he shared with Kathy and outside Gilberta's house, Kathy's friend, the one who hosted the party the night Kathy went missing. She was out one morning walking her dog. I noticed this truck, this old beat up truck, very light color yellow, going slow. And there's a man, well I think it's a man because there's a flannel shirt. The driver's wearing a flannel shirt, but he's got on a wig, a cheap woman's wig, shoulder length, black shiny hair, and I kept thinking to myself, it looks like Susie Berman's, you know, bangs, and I'm like, oh. This person looked lost, so Gilberta asked if he needed help. The man turns around and I look at him and it's Bobby. And I looked at him straight in the eye and I said, this probably will get bleeped, but I don't care. You motherfucker, this is my neighborhood. And I start running at the truck, okay? And I'm pounding on the door. If the door was open, I think I would have pulled him out, you know? I was gonna, I, I had this vision of, he was gonna tell me what happened to Kathy. Bob didn't stick around to chat with Gilberta. Truck speeds up. I run back to my car. I get in my car and I chase him all over New Haven. I lose him. I go to the train station because I'm picking up a coworker, and I use her cell phone and I call the investigators and I said, you know, Bob was in my neighborhood. This is what he was driving. This is what he was wearing. This is, he had on a cheap wig. And if you put a hundred flannel shirts on a table, I will pick the one he was wearing because I've committed it to memory. It turns out Bob was staying in Connecticut at the time at a hotel, and the police would later find directions to Gilberta's house and work in his possession. But Bob's suspicious behavior towards Gilberta is not why he eventually got caught. His downfall as a fugitive was, of course, all because of a supermarket hoagie. I don't know what gave me the idea that I should shoplift, see if I could get away with it or whatever it was, but I decided rather than the pay, I was just gonna take it. As I was leaving, the, the two security people were out front, and they have to talk to me, we're sorry, you'll have to come with us, blah, blah, blah. Idiotically, I went with them, um, and, and I was arrested. When Bob was arrested, he did not look like himself. He was completely bald. Why were you bald? I was on the lamb, I was trying to disguise myself, and that worked real good. Did you shave your eyebrows? Everything. Why? It looks more like a, less like me. You, you, you look like a, you look weird with your eyebrows shaved in addition to your head. And that was intentional? Yeah, how do you accidentally shave your eyebrows? Thought-provoking question there from Bob. And that brings us to the end of chapter three. Next time on the Jinx Podcast, We'll go down to Galveston, Texas, and find out what Bob got up to before his arrest for the murder of Morris Black. That included wearing a wig to disguise himself as a woman. Went to a wig store, 
tried on the wig, and I said, gosh, this looks pretty, pretty, pretty good. I'm going to be looking sort of like a woman, or if not just like a woman, close enough. And we'll learn more about Bob's relationship with Morris Black and a theory about why things took such a dark turn. Morris Black was dangerous with a gun. That's why Bob bought the 22 target pistol, because Morris Black was dangerous with the 9 millimeter. Didn't know how to handle it. Bam, 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 he'd shoot it. That's next time. The official Jinx podcast is hosted by me, Zach Stewart Pontier. It's produced by ZSP Media and Hit the Ground Running Films with HBO. Watch episodes of The Jinx and stream The Jinx Part 2 starting April 21st on Max. This episode was produced by Ethan Oberman. The rest of our team is Laura Newcomb, Naomi Brauner, and Ramoy Phillip. The supervising producer is Liz Stiles. This episode was edited by Simone Polanin. Mixing and engineering by Robin Shore. It was recorded at Relic Room in New York City. Music by Wes David Thordson. Additional music courtesy of HBO. The executive producers are Andrew Jarecki and me, Zach Stewart-Pontier. Special thanks to Michael Gluckstadt, Ali Cohen, Aaron Kelly, and Savon Slater at HBO Podcasts. And the fabulous Jinx team, Sam Neve, Kyle Martin, Susan Lazarus, Annabelle White, Pedro Vital, Jesse Herman, Michele Zabarfian, Nako Narder, Charlotte Kaufman, and Richard Hankin. And thanks to Ro Dillon, George Vogel, Charlie Wessler, Nancy Jarecki, and Emily Wiedemann. And you. Thank you for listening. And you made it through the credits. Again. As a treat, here's a story of Gilberta confronting Bob at his hearing. Yes, he had power. Yes, he had money. And yes, he could have me killed. But I can drive you crazy. Okay, and when I showed up in Pennsylvania and just popped out, you know, as he's walking down the hall, it was just another attempt for me to show him, you have nothing. I've got you psychologically.